Lord Most High. Folks, we've longed for this day when we could be back together again, singing again and praising our God. So let's stand and let's sing together. Water you turn into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. None like you. Into the darkness you shine. And out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you. None like you. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are high. Out of the ashes we rise, there's no one like you, none like you. Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are high. together again. Let's pray. Father, it is our desire today to worship you in spirit and in truth. To worship you as the living God, the same power that raised Jesus from death to life is active here today in our lives, is working in this world, is working in this church, is working in this time and in this place and season of life that we're in. In this time that we have together as a church, 
give us a mind to know you and hearts to love you and voices to sing your praise. May the truth we experience today empower us to do your will. In the darkness we were waiting without hope and without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a bird who came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt and praise the father praise the son Praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, and praise forever to the King of kings, to reveal the kingdom come. Till the stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe. For the souls of all who come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was King of kings, Christ himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live 
for righteousness. By his wounds, we have been healed. So let me encourage you to bring your sin, bring your sorrow, bring your shame and your guilt and lay them down at the foot of his cross. Come and find rest, come and find forgiveness and come and find the peace that Christ offers all of us through his blood. sisters, as we come to the cross, we find forgiveness. We find peace. And as we find peace with God that he showed it to us, it's our responsibility in turn to share that peace with the people in this room, with the people outside this room. So brothers and sisters, 
May the peace of Christ be with you. Amen. You may be seated. I don't know about you, but I need to take a deep breath. I'm like, whew, so much emotion. Um, good morning. My name is Hilda Gamichia, and I am the Women's Ministries Coordinator here at Orangewood, and I cannot be more excited to be here and to see church full like this, all of us together, everybody's faces. It is our hope that you guys feel warm and wanted. So would you please check in to orangewood.org, yeah, no, sorry, to Orangewood on the app, to new at Orangewood and text the number 970000 if you are new because we would love to connect with you if you have any questions for us. We also want you to check in because we are better together. So if you're here or at home, um, use your app and let us know that you're here. We would love to um, just connect with you in that way as well. I also um, have the privilege to let you know that spring giving today is the last day, and there are two recipients to our spring giving um, currently. The first one is our global partner, um, Walford Thompson. Um, we heard from him and the devastating volcanic eruption that happened in St. Vincent, and you also have an opportunity to give to our general fund, which usually during the summertime tends to be pretty low and we get a little behind. So the first $20,000 that we raise will be matched by someone generously. And um, to date, we have $10,000 for Wofford and his, um, to help him in St. Vincent. And we have $5,000 in the general fund. So we have plenty of time. We know you guys are great about this. So please go on to the Church Center app and you can do the Give tab or you can do orangewood.org backslash giving and go to the spring giving drop-down option. Um, the last thing I wanna share is something that's kind of dear and near to my heart, being um, the Women's Ministries Coordinator here. And I'm gonna read from Galatians 22 and 25. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. And since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. And in line with that, in the 168 living, where it's not just here on Sunday, but every day we engage with one another through the Spirit, um, I'd like to invite you to um, summer gatherings. Now, we finished our, fall, our spring study super strong. We had over 90 women um, as part of our Bible study in over eight different groups. That was amazing and exciting. Um, so we wanted to keep it going. And especially for those of you who are new and have reached out to me, I wanted to have an opportunity for you guys to connect with the women here at Orangewood so that you wouldn't have to wait till the fall till we started our next Bible study. So these are all centered on the fruit of the Spirit, and we have four gatherings. Um, you can make it to one or you can make it to all of them. Sign up now. It's live on the Church Center app. And it's all under the theme, and we'll be discussing a different fruit um, of the Spirit, but we'll also be engaging in um, some fun activities, fun conversations, whether it's memorizing scripture or whether it's lettering. So you're going to have to come and find out. If you have any questions, please reach out to me. And now um, let us stand and continue our worship.
seated. As uh, you sit down, we're going to dismiss our first through fourth graders to O Kids Worship. So if you're in first through fourth grade, you're dismissed to my left, uh, to your right. And you know what? I was supposed to leave you standing because we're going to read scripture. So I'll say it so Mark doesn't have to. I'm sorry. Let's stand back up. <laughs> grace and peace. Grace and peace. <laughs> Well, it is an honor to be with you. It's so good um, to see you all and to be together in this room. Uh, I'm going to read a short passage, and then I'll pray for us, and then I'll let you sit down. Does that sound good? Our, uh, we're going to read a lot of scripture today, but the one we're going to start with is Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. And this is what it says. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. This is the word of the Lord. God. Let's pray before you sit down. God, uh, we just sang that we are here for you and that our hearts are open and we know that you are here with us and that is always true but i pray that you would make us aware of your presence and i pray that you would open our hearts to hear your word and that your son jesus would be glorified and we pray this in his name amen now you can sit down 
So today we're starting a new sermon series called The Miners, and it's a survey of the minor prophets. So we'll cover one minor prophet a week for the next 10 weeks. And if you're like me, you probably don't spend a ton of time reading the minor prophets, even though they're among the shortest books in the Bible, they're probably the least read. And uh, I think it's because, frankly, we're intimidated by them. And I created an infographic that I think is helpful that can illustrate the average Christian's relationship with the minor prophets. So, uh, and I'm, I'm saying me, I put myself in this category. I'm scared of minor prophets because I don't understand them. And because I don't understand them, I don't read them. And because I don't read them, I'm scared of them because I don't understand them. Can anybody relate to that? Um, there are various uh, barriers to entry with the minor prophets, like how do you even pronounce Habakkuk? Um, what are they so angry about? Does this have anything to do with me? Um, but uh, I want to give you one good reason to read the prophets, the minor prophets and the major prophets, and it comes from Luke 24, 27. Following his resurrection, Jesus talks to two men while walking down the road. And Luke says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. In other words, all of scripture, including the minor prophets, point to Jesus. And anything that points to Jesus, especially God's word, is worth our time and attention. So uh, my goal is that by the end of today, or at least by the end of this summer, you won't feel so intimidated by the minor prophets. And to help us uh, keep some of the key facts about each prophet straight, we're giving out minor prophet trading cards each week at the table in the lobby. So uh, today you'll get three cards and they'll come in a little card holder like this so that each week the card you get you can add to it. Um, and, the, and the cards look like this. You'll see it has a uh, artist rendering of the prophet. It's got some good stats and an overview of it. Um, so you'll get three today. After today, you'll get one a week. And also today, while supplies last, after the sermon, your kids can pick either Big League Chew or Cracker Jacks. Uh, we're sticking with the baseball theme. So that's something to look forward to today. Also, unrelated to the Minor Prophets, I want to let you know, and this is big, um, a family has generously donated copies of The Practice of the Presence of God by Brother Lawrence so that you can have a copy. They're on the tables out front. And this is the book that I have probably recommended more than any other book um, in my life. If you don't know about it, you can tell it's small, it's thin, it's easy to read. Frankly, I call it a back of the toilet book because you can just read it for a minute and you're good till the next time you're there. Um, <laughs> probably shouldn't have added that detail. Um, but uh, the point is, it's short and easy to read, but if you take it seriously, it'll change your life. It has changed mine, so I am so happy that you all have access to it. So grab a copy for your household on the way out this morning. Okay, the basics of the Minor Prophets. We ready to go? Let's do this. Minor Prophets. I can tell you're really fired up. <laughs> there are 12 Minor Prophets, and uh, in fact, historically, they've been referred to as the 12 Prophets the Book of the Twelve, or just the Twelve. And the Minor Prophets are called Minor only because of their short length. It doesn't mean that they're less important than the other Prophets. And this summer, as we go through uh, the Prophets, we're not going to follow the same order that they come in your Bible. And I've actually got a, sh uh, a chart to compare the two. And I'm showing you this mostly so that you can see what the um, books are there. But your Bible... Uh, sort of puts them in topical order and sort of in chronological order. And we're going to go largely in chronological order, except for today, we're going to look at three prophets that are a little harder to date. 
Um, and in addition to those minor profits, there's a chart with the major profits. There's five of those, and they're the ones that you might be more familiar with. Um, so you can see those there. So everything this morning that we're going to learn about profits applies to both the major and minor profits, but this summer we're focusing on the minor profits. Um, okay, so I have this awkward experience fairly often, and I don't know if others have it, but have you ever talked to someone that you don't know all that well, and then they reference a person, and you think, am I supposed to know who this person is? Because you're talking to me like you've told me about this before, but I don't think I know who this is. And they're like, you know, pray for Mike. I'm like, yeah, I will. Who's Mike? <laughs> um, so if you read the Minor Prophets and you don't understand the context, that's kind of what's going on. There's like names and stuff, and you're like, am I supposed to know who this is? Um, you need to know the context, and so that we can understand the context, we're going to do a brief overview of the history of Israel, and we're going to use a timeline to try to keep things straight, and the timeline is going to start with Abraham. So here we go. It's going to be a review for some of you, but it's going to be good to connect the dots. So Abraham was the father of the people group who would become known as Israel, and in Genesis 12, God made a covenant with Abraham, and this is very important. Covenants were God's way of speaking to his people. And this is, this is what God said to Abraham in Genesis 12. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So God called Abraham to leave his home in an act of faith, and God promised Abraham land and descendants who would bless all the families of the earth. So this already, if it sounds like some obscure, ancient, Near Eastern piece of history, it already has something to do with you and me, because through this covenant, God is going to bless all the families of the earth. Abraham, you might remember, had a son named Isaac. And Isaac had twin sons, Jacob and Esau. And God later changed Jacob's name to Israel. And Israel, or Jacob, had 12 sons. Are you following me so far? I can slow down if you're not. The descendants of those 12 sons became tribes, and together they became known as the nation of Israel. And they're also called Hebrews or Jews throughout Scripture. So when we hear of Israel, they're all descendants of Jacob. So Israel, or Jacob, and the rest of his family moved to Egypt to take refuge from a famine. But it wasn't long before the Egyptians made the Israelites slaves, and they remained slaves in Egypt for 430 years. And then called, God called Moses to be both a prophet and a leader for Israel. And this is the next big point on our timeline that you see there. Moses is another person that God made one of these important covenants with. So through Moses, you might remember, God freed Israel from slavery through a series of miracles, the plagues, and it culminated in the Passover. And then he parted the Red Sea so that they could walk over on dry land. And for the next 40 years, the people of Israel lived as nomads in the wilderness as God led them to the promised land, which was the land promised to Abraham in that original covenant. So uh, during that time, God revealed his law to Israel through Moses on Mount Sinai. And the law, there were lots of laws, but the ones that we're most familiar with are the Ten Commandments. And he also gave the Israelites instructions on how to construct a temple and how to keep it holy so that God could dwell among them. And I just want to pause and say, deep in the heart of every human being, whether we're able to put our finger on it or not, what our hearts long for is to dwell with God, to be in his presence. And ever since sin entered the world and God cast Adam and Eve out of the garden, out of his presence, our dilemma has been how can we come back into God's presence? But he makes it his dilemma. 
He makes it his work to come to us and figure out a way that we can be in his presence. And it's not that he's like the wicked witch and if our sin gets on him, he's going to melt. It's that we will be destroyed in our sinfulness if we come into the presence of a holy God. So the fact that God gave them instructions for a tabernacle, for a temple where his presence could dwell is a very big deal. And in the same way that God had made a covenant with Abraham, he now makes one with all of Israel through Moses. And the covenant is basically that if they keep his commands, they will remain in the promised land in the presence of God. And if not, they'll be cut off from the land and basically cut off from the presence of God. So after 40 years of wandering through the wilderness and a so-so job of actually keeping God's commands, the Israelites reached the promised land. But Moses died before entering the promised land, so his successor, Joshua, actually led the Israelites into the promised land. And once again, God parts another body of water, this time the Jordan River, so that the Israelites can cross over on dry land. So if you look at the book of Joshua, it's all about the Israelites fighting the inhabitants and conquering what we now call Israel, the promised land. And each of the 12 tribes, once they had more or less conquered it, uh, took an area of Israel based on their size. And we've got a map of that um, where you can see the 12 tribes divided up there. And one thing that you'll notice is that most of the southern region belonged to Judah. And for centuries to come, the southern region of Israel would be called Judah, even in Jesus' day. That southern region of Israel was called Judah. So uh, for a while after this, Israel was ruled by judges, and that was mostly a mess. And you can read about that in the book of Judges. That's where you have the story of Samson and Gideon, and there's some real weird stuff in there that's worth reading. Um, eventually, God called a king to rule over Israel. And the first one, King Saul, was not so great. But the second king of Israel was King David. He's the next big point on our timeline, and you've probably heard of King David. He was a man after God's own heart. And the reign of David and his son Solomon was the golden age of Israel. It was a time of great prosperity, great uh, victory, and eventually even peace. And during this time, God made a covenant with King David in the same way he had made one with Abraham and in the same way he had made one with the Israelites at Mount Sinai. He made a covenant and promised that David would always have a descendant on the throne for eternity. So his son Solomon built a glorious temple for the Lord. When you hear about the temple, that's the one we're talking about, this big, elaborate, glorious temple that Solomon made. But pretty soon after that, things fell apart because Solomon didn't follow God's commands. In fact, uh, it might ring a bell. Solomon, wisest man on earth, also had 700 wives and 300 concubines. So I'm not sure how that makes him the wisest man on earth, but... That's what he did. And in 1 Kings 11, the Lord said this to Solomon. Since this has been your practice and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes that I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. So at this point in history, it kind of seems like hope is lost because his dad, God made this covenant with him. You're going you're gonna to have a descendant on the throne forever. And then one generation later... Never mind, I'm stripping it away from you. So it seems like hope is lost. When Solomon died, and I would say, like, for most people who grow up in church, everything I've mentioned so far is kind of ringing a bell. And then the, the parts after this are where it get a little bit hazy. When Solomon died, his son Rehoboam succeeded him. So Solomon's son was Rehoboam. But Rehoboam was basically a jerk, and the northern tribes didn't like him at all. And one of Solomon's former servants named Jeroboam, I realize that's confusing, the servant was Jeroboam, he rose up against Rehoboam, and all of the northern tribes followed him. But the tribe of Benjamin and the tribe of Judah remained loyal to Solomon. So even though uh, God was stripping the throne away, 
he kept that little piece intact so that his covenant promises would remain true. So the nation of Israel was divided into a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. And this is a key concept for understanding the prophets um, because it can get confusing if you don't know what's going on there because uh, names get thrown out and you're like, what? Why are there, why is Israel fighting Israel? It doesn't make sense. But this is why it makes sense. And you can see there a map uh, that uh, shows the division. And there were many maps that I could have chosen, but I chose one that had goofy looking pictures of Jeroboam and Rehoboam. Um, so usually the northern kingdom, which is the yellowish orange there, is referred to as Israel. And this can be confusing because all of Israel is Israel, but after it was divided, the northern kingdom is called Israel. And the southern ki kingdom is usually referred to as Judah. So if you can keep that straight, that one fact alone will help you understand some things that are going on in the prophets. And the second key concept to keep in mind when reading prophets is the exile. Exile is when a nation or a people group is forced to leave their home and this happened to the people of Israel. So for years, the Lord spoke to the people of both Israel and Judah through prophets. That's what we're going to be reading this summer. Warning them to keep God's covenant and to stop worshiping false gods or else they would be exiled. But eventually, they were exiled. Um, but the exile happened in stages. The northern kingdom was exiled first and then later the southern kingdom. So if we go back to our timeline, I think you'll see in 722 BC, the northern kingdom was taken captive by the Assyrian Empire. And this is the part where I might lose some of you. So the northern kingdom was taken captive by the major world power at that point, which was Assyria. And just to give you a little context, if you remember the story of Jonah, God calls him to Nineveh. Well, that's like the capital of Assyria. So you can understand why Jonah might have been a little ticked off that God wanted to have mercy on Assyria because they were the world power. They were seen as the enemy. And eventually, they conquered the northern kingdom and took it over. And knowing this helps us establish time frames when we're reading the prophets because if you're reading about Assyria invading, it's probably talking about the northern kingdom and it means that Assyria was the main world power and lets you know kind of the time frame. But later, the Babylonian Empire rose to power and started conquering land, including Judah. So in 586 BC, Babylon destroyed Jerusalem, which was the capital of Judah. And uh, they destroyed the city, and that included the temple and the majority of its inhabitants were forced into exile. So at that point, 586, most of the Jews were in exile. There, was, there were some remaining in the northern and southern kingdom, but they were under the thumb of the major world powers. Um, so that's the exile. If you, if you look at the timeline there on the top, you'll see exile to Assyria in 722 for the northern kingdom. And on the bottom, you'll see two little lines because there was like a small exile first where Babylon took the most important people out of Jerusalem and exiled them. And then in 586, pretty much everybody else went. So basically by 586, Israel is completely displaced, completely homeless, completely cut off from the presence of God like he had said that they would be. And then in 539 BC, yet another empire rises up and defeats Babylon. It's the Persian Empire. And after that, the Israelites were actually allowed to return to Israel. So you see that line after the exile. Um, that's after they have returned back to the land of mostly Judah. And if you read Ezra and Nehemiah, what they're doing is rebuilding the city and rebuilding the temple. And I just want to uh, go off my notes and say, I was thinking this morning as I heard all the singing this morning and as I saw everyone's faces, there's this beautiful scene in Nehemiah after they've finally gone back and spent all this time rebuilding. They rebuild the walls around the city 
And it says that these choirs of Jews went up on the four walls of the city and there's this great day of rejoicing. And it couldn't have happened if they hadn't suffered such loss and been exiled for so long. And it just uh, hits me that this morning is sort of like our day of standing on the walls and rejoicing after feeling exiled from one another and from this place. So that is a probably long but still brief overview of the history of Israel. And based on this historical context now, when reading a prophet, we can ask three questions. We can ask, when were they writing? Where were they? And who were they writing to? And I, I started it with when, where, who, but if there are any grammar nerds, it should be to whom were they writing for that third one. So uh, when were they writing? You're really asking when were they written in relation to the exile. If you look at our timeline again, you can see that there were some prophets who were writing before the exile, there were some during the exile, and there were some after the exile. And you can see that on the timeline there. So um, that's one of the main ways that we can place when it was. Where were they? You're asking, was the prophet in Israel? Uh, were they in Judah? Or were they in exile themselves? Um, and then who were they writing to? Was this message to the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom? Uh, was this to another nation? And if you read, most of the Psalms have messages to multiple people. And when you're asking who are they writing to, you're also sort of asking who is the audience that would have heard this or read this? Because we'll see in Obadiah today, he was prophesying about the nation of Edom, but it was really the people of Judah who have been the ones reading it and hearing it. So even though he's prophesying about these people, it's for his audience's benefit. Um, so, we're, we're almost going to start talking about an actual prophet, but first I thought there are a few things you should know about prophets, like what is a prophet? I thought that might be a good thing to cover. So we're going to jump to the New Testament and look at that passage we looked at at the beginning, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. It says, long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. There is a lot of deep theology just in those two verses. Um, but what I want to point out is this tells us that God spoke to the Jews through the prophets, but he doesn't anymore because now he speaks through Jesus. Prophets were the mouthpiece of God, speaking the very words of God. And many people think of prophets as fortune tellers but prophecy is more important for what it tells us about God's character and God's heart uh, than for predictions about the future. And don't get me wrong, prophetics, pro prophets do foretell things in the future, and they're sure to come to fruition, but they're more important for what it tells us about God's heart, his priorities, how he's moving, how he's relating to mankind. Um, a prophet's primary role was to remind God's people of the covenant. Prophet's primary role was to remind God's people of the covenant, urging them to keep God's commands and reminding them of the blessings promised in the covenants. So there are two consistent themes throughout all prophets. Judgment and hope. Judgment and hope are the two themes that you're going to find in all the prophets. And judgment isn't a theme that we love talking about in church because we don't want to turn people off from Christianity and sound all judgy. But the prophets talked about judgment a lot. And that's why they can often come off as sounding angry. But I think of it this way. God gave the prophets eyes to see what no one else was able to see that the house was on fire and that everyone was asleep. And if you're wanting to wake people up and save them from destruction, you're not going to be like, Psst, guys, guys, I don't want to bother you. If you had a chance, just throw some water on that. You're not, you're not going to go about it that way. You're going to say, guys, this is burning, and if you don't want to be destroyed, we need to do something now. 
So that's the tone that the prophets are taking with the people of Israel. And what's amazing, even in this, is you look at the hundreds of years that the prophets spanned, God was very patient and merciful. But finally, it, it came, exile came. And when exile comes, God speaks through Ezekiel to remind them of why it's happening. Almost like a parent punishing a child. He's like, hey, I told you, if you didn't obey, the house was going to burn down and you were going to have to leave home. And now it's happening. So he's even faithful to like comfort them when they're being punished for their sin. Judgment in the prophets is often referred to as the day of the Lord. And sometimes it's like a current event, like a natural disaster. In Joel, it's like locust plagues. Or it might be warfare that happens um, as judgment on a, on a people group. But ultimately, the day of the Lord is talking about the return of Christ. It's going to be a day of rejoicing for those who honor God, but a day of dread for those who don't. And it will be judgment on all nations, including Israel. See, the people of Israel thought that because they were God's chosen people, they would be immune to judgment, that it would just fall on their enemies. But the prophets warned them that the fact is that since they are God's people and they have his commands and know how they ought to live, it actually makes it worse for them. And this should be a sober warning to us who think we're fine to do whatever whim hits us because we call ourselves Christians and we have a golden ticket to heaven. Just a couple of weeks ago, Tyler preached on Matthew 7 where Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And this is coming from the mouth of Jesus, the one that we think is not like that angry Old Testament God. He's the the like teddy bear Jesus. He's, there's no judgment with Jesus, right? But that's what he says. And if we want the truth, then we have to take in all of Scripture. And judgment is a consistent theme in the prophets, but so is hope. Remember, the prophets' primary role was to remind God's people of the covenant so the theme of hope emerges in prophets too. The day of the Lord will be a day when God will have a universal reign. And he's going to make all things new. And he's going to eradicate sin. And he's going to wipe the tears from our eyes. He's going to give his people new hearts of obedience so that we can be in the presence of God where we all long to be. And this is still our hope. This is the great Christian hope. The day of the Lord and we can see throughout Scripture and even in our own history that God is bringing it to fruition through Jesus Christ and even through us, the church. And that is good news. I need one more amen than that. Amen. That's good news. So with that in mind, let's talk about some minor prophets, shall we? You're probably like, I thought that was your closing point, man. Just getting going here. All right. You're getting three trading cards today, Jonah, Obadiah, and Joel. You're getting Obadiah and Joel because there's uncertainty about where they fall in the timeline. You're getting Jonah because we're not actually going to discuss him this summer. And here, here, here's the reason why. Here, here's the reason why. The book of Jonah is kind of a different animal. Um, he comes pretty early compared to the other ones. And it focuses more on Jonah himself rather than his prophecy. In fact, the book of Jonah only has one line of prophecy in the whole book. And uh, so the purpose of Jonah differs quite a bit from the other 11. And besides that, like, it's probably the one minor prophet you're kind of familiar with. But if you want to know more about Jonah, read your trading card. Uh, but better than that, read Jonah. It's only four chapters, and it's riveting, all of it. And most of us know the first two and then we kind of forget about the last two, but it gets weird, guys. Read it. Um, and more good news, if you're in middle school or high school, the summer Bible studies are going to be on Jonah this summer. So students have a leg up on the rest of you guys. All right, Joel. Joel is the prophet that is the most difficult to place 
chronologically because he doesn't mention a king, he doesn't mention a foreign power, he doesn't mention any event that would help us to place it in its historical context. But because he doesn't mention a king, but does talk about priests in the temple, he was likely writing after the exile. Because you remember, after the exile, they went back and they rebuilt the temple. So they had a temple and they had priests, but there weren't kings. Joel also doesn't talk a lot about sins, which is the most thing, the biggest thing that prophets were talking about before the exile. So most historians think he probably came later. For that reason, we're actually going to save him and talk about him the very last day of our sermon series. And this leaves Obadiah, where we're going to spend the next two hours. Uh, Obadiah, fortunately, is the shortest book in the Old Testament. It's only 21 verses. And Obadiah, like Joel, doesn't mention a king or something specific that would allow us to place it for certain. But it was most likely written during the exile or shortly after the exile. And I'm going to show you why. But first, we're going to ask one of our questions. Who is it written to? And it's a good one to start with because it answers it in verse 1. So look at that with me. Verse 1 says, The vision of Obadiah, thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a report from the Lord, and a messenger has been sent among the nations. Rise up, let us rise against her for battle. So this tells us that Obadiah is a prophet. It tells us that prophecy concerns Edom in Obadiah, and that the Lord is waging war against Edom. So the answer to who Obadiah is written to is pretty simple. It's Edom, Edom, but that doesn't help us much if you don't know who Edom is. And if you're like me, maybe you didn't. Um, so I'm going to tell you. If you look back at our map of the 12 tribes, you'll see that Edom was a nation southeast of Judah. You see that there? Um, so if you recall, Israel took its name from Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. And Jacob had a twin brother named Esau. So Esau uh, became known as Edom. Fun fact, Edom means red, which was both the color of Esau's hair and the color of the porridge that he ate uh, when he sold his birthright to Jacob. So he became known as Edom, and his descendants became the nation of Edom. So not only is Edom close to Israel in proximity, Edom and Israel are sibling nations that both trace their heritage back to Abraham and Isaac. So the big question is, why was the Lord waging war against Edom? And that's a good question. Uh, let's look at verses 10 through 12. This is what it says. Because of the violence done to your brother Jacob, and this is the Lord talking to the nation of Edom, because of the violence done to your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you and you shall be cut off forever. On the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gate and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. But do not gloat over the day of your brother in the day of his misfortune. Do not rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their ruin. Do not boast in the day of distress. When I was a kid, uh, I got bullied by some kids at my church. And there was this one kid, Jason, who was like a year older than me and a foot taller than me. And he gave it to me the worst. And there was this one Wednesday night after church, like we were on this hill and he just kept pushing me down and I would stand up and he would push me down again. And I was like trying not to cry because I wanted to be a big kid, but it was really frustrating me. What Jason didn't know is that my older brother was seeing this from a distance. And when he saw what was happening, he took care of it. Because that's what brothers do. But not eat them. When Babylon came and invaded Jerusalem, this is the invasion in 586 that led to them being exiled and the temple being destroyed. When Babylon came and invaded... They didn't come in to help. And worse than that, Edom took advantage of Judah's vulnerability. They raided Israelite cities. They even took captive Israelites and killed them. So Edom kicked his brother when he was down. 
This is why the Lord was waging war against Edom. And I want to point out that since Obadiah is talking about things that Edom did to Judah when they were being sieged by Babylon, it makes sense to assume that he's writing this either during the exile or shortly after the exile. But even though the prophecy was about what was going to happen to Edom, the real audience was Judah, the people who had been hurt by their brother. And it was a prophecy, like most prophecies, of judgment and hope. Look at verse 15 with me. It says, For the day of the Lord is near upon all the nations. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return on your own head. So this prophecy started as judgment on Edom, but now it's extended to all nations. It was judgment for Edom for being prideful and violent, and now it's saying any nation who is prideful and violent are going to meet this sort of end. It's using Edom as an example. All of these are probably obscure references to you, and a question that you may be asking and is good to ask is, what does this have to do with me? And here's what it has to do with all of us. I know without a doubt that everyone in this room, regardless of your age, has been hurt by someone they trusted and felt betrayed. And it's one of the most painful things that we have to experience in this life, and yet it's something that I don't think any of us go through life without experiencing. We experience it in varying degrees, like a business deal with a friend that has gone bad, or finding out that your good friend had a party and didn't invite you, or finding out that people are talking about you behind your back and even your friend joined in or a spouse cheating on you. There are degrees of betrayal and hurt, but we all know it. And the day of the Lord gives us hope and comfort that we're not always going to be blindsided and hurt and betrayed. God will make things new and make things right. But remember, it's the day of the Lord and not the day of Israel that the prophets talk about. The Lord is the one who brings vengeance and makes things right. There's a warning to us by the Apostle Paul in Romans 12. He says, Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay says the Lord. Jesus told us to turn the other cheek. He said, if you don't forgive others their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Revenge never really gives us what we think it will. The way of Jesus, the way of an abundant life, is to forgive others and allow him who has no sin to deal with the sin of others. There's also a sober warning for all of us not to be the violent and arrogant sibling who betrays and takes advantage of others' weaknesses because many of us are in positions where we can exploit someone's weakness or ignorance for our own gain. We can speak ill of others when they're not in our presence and we might get a laugh. But the call is to treat others with the dignity that they inherently have because they are created in the image of God. Obadiah has plenty to do with us, but Obadiah also presents us with a problem. And we're going to look at this. This is the last thing. In verse 16, the Lord says, For as you have drunk on my holy mountain, so all the nations shall drink continually. They shall drink and swallow and shall be as though they had never been. And at first it's like, that sounds pretty good, drinking on God's holy mountain. I'm up for that. But then it takes a really dark turn. And you wonder, what is this drink? The drink that the Lord mentions is the cup of God's wrath. And the nations will drink his wrath until it will be like they had never even existed. And this is a problem for us who don't belong to one of the 12 tribes of Israel, 
and I imagine that's most of us, but it's a problem that Jesus Christ has solved for us. When I think of heartbreaking betrayal, how can I not think of Judas, one of the 12 disciples, betraying his rabbi and handing him over to be crucified? Verse 11 of Obadiah says, On the day that foreigners cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. How can I not think of soldiers casting lots for Jesus' clothing? And yet the Lord says, you were one of them. My sins crucified Jesus. And when I read that the nations will continually drink the cup of God's wrath, how can I not think of my Lord on his knees begging God, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. See, it wasn't primarily the Roman nails that Jesus dreaded so much. It was the cup of God's wrath that he drank on my behalf. If you are in Christ, you are Israel. And God's promises are for you. Galatians 3.29 says, If you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. The problem that the prophecy in Obadiah causes for us is solved in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Because of Jesus Christ, the hope of Judah in exile is our hope too. That wherever you find yourself this morning, whatever hurts and betrayals you feel, as we come to the table, remember that because of Jesus, we have a father. We have a family. We have a home that can't be destroyed or taken from us. And we have a promise that things will be made right. Let's pray. God, thank you that you have spoken to us through the prophets. Thank you that you still speak to us now through your son, Jesus. And Lord, I pray that you would use the words of Obadiah and the other prophets to encourage us. And right now, I pray that you would draw our minds and our hearts to Jesus Christ for the new covenant that fulfilled all covenants and gave us a hope that we couldn't even comprehend. Nourish us now as we come to the table. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, brothers and sisters, we come to the table to receive and to be nourished this morning. Um, we receive this meal. How are we nourished? Well, we learn from the Bible that we come to be nourished and to receive all the benefits, everything that Christ has accomplished in the gospel, as Pastor Mark has told us about. All the judgment that should have fallen on us has fallen on him. And that means from now through the rest of our lives, we receive all of those great benefits. And we come to this table as a means of grace, a, a reminder, a meal of the nourishment, of the grace that is ours forever. Uh, we come to this table uh, and we're going to receive just simple bread and juice together. Um, we're going to receive it in, in, a, in a wafer that you may wonder, does the efficacy of the Spirit pass through such a wafer? But it does. It does. Um, we'll take part of that together. Our elders will pass it uh, to you in just a little bit. Uh, unless you are in need of gluten-free or prefer just a safer option, we'll have it over here to my left, your right. Um, you can come during the next song to receive that. But we'd ask whether you receive it from an elder or you receive it there, uh, take it back to your seat, hold on to it. We'll partake together uh, after everyone has received the elements. If you're a follower of Jesus, a brother or sister in the faith, I invite you to come to receive this meal. I invite you to taste and to see that the Lord is good, that there is grace no matter what you're carrying this morning. Uh, there is nourishment for you no matter what you are facing. I invite you to come. Uh, if you're here this morning and you are still 
uh, have questions about the Christian faith, you're, you're, you still have doubts, you, you, you haven't fully trusted Jesus as your own Lord and Savior, first of all, I'll just say it, we're so glad that you're here. Um, I hope you feel welcomed uh, amongst us. But we'd ask, this is a family meal, we'd ask that you just refrain from taking during this time and just to sit and ponder, uh, am I ready to receive uh, the great message of the gospel that we receive in this act that our faith isn't achieved, it is received by the one who has died and has risen. And so we ask you to just sit and receive this moment, uh, ask you to refrain from taking. If you have young kids with you, we just ask that you would uh, hold them off from partaking as well until they've had a chance to uh, put their own faith and trust in Jesus and present that to the leaders uh, of our church. On the night that he was betrayed, uh, Jesus, he, he took the bread and he broke it. He gave it to his disciples. He said, this is my body, which is given for you. Take and eat. And in the same way, he took the cup. And as he gave it to his disciples, he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sin. So, so whenever you eat of this bread and you drink of this cup, you proclaim my death until I come again. And so friends, brothers and sisters this morning, I invite you to come and receive Receive the benefits, receive the grace that Jesus has longed for you to have. We're going to sing uh, in just a little bit a song uh, afterwards uh, about how the evil one calls you and I to tremble. How about you and I to tremble under the weight of how we can't make it. This meal is, is the great word of God to us that no matter what has happened in your life, through faith in Jesus Christ, you have received everything you need. So come empty-handed, come with nothing to offer, and come and receive. Uh, just a little bit after I pray, uh, invite our elders forward to come uh, get the elements during the next song. Church, let's pray together. Or our gracious Father, we do come to this meal expectant and needy. Uh, we come ready to receive. <laughs> we have nothing to offer. Uh, but we come knowing that in this meal you have provided every possible thing we need for grace and peace with you. And so may we take it knowing that you meet us here with that nourishment. May we take it knowing that we may be full of hope that is not about us at all, but that everything has been accomplished, every preparation has been made, that we can taste and see that you are good now through all eternity. We pray this in Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen, amen. I will feast at the table of the Lord. I will feast at the table of the Lord. And I won't hunger anymore at his table. I will feast at the table of the Lord. I will feast at the table of the Lord. And I won't hunger anymore. At his table Come all you weary Come and find His yoke is easy His burden light He is able He will restore At the table
a place for me. Oh, what joy will fill my heart with the saints around the mercy seat of God. Before we take together as a church family, uh, those of you who received or needing gluten-free, we actually handed out to you the wrong one. Uh, and for allergy purposes, I'd hate for you to partake now. So if you are in need of the gluten-free uh, elements, uh, we would ask that you'd come back after the service. We'll, ha we'll have you grab one if you want after the service, and we'll, we'll partake together with you. So um, never had that happen before in a service, but uh, we'll do it together today. Uh, you go ahead and rip off the top layer. Be very careful. Make sure it's the top layer on the package you received. And grab the wafer. Uh, church, uh, we are reminded Jesus said to us, um, this is my body which is given for you. So now let us take and eat at that time. Now you can pull back the other cover, which you'll find the juice. Church, Jesus said, this is my body and my blood that is given for you. Take now, we take together. Let's pray. Father, we, we have come to your table as we've just sung and song, that we have no reason to tremble, no reason to fear, because we know you will make all things right in us and through us. And at the great redemption of all things, all will be made right. And so, Jesus, allow us to live with hope for that day. Allow us to live in the grace and the presence of what you have provided in your gospel as we have taken and we have eaten and drunk of your table. We pray this in Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. amen, amen. Well, as they had finished that meal together, Scripture says they closed with a song, and so let us stand and sing together as a church. So we were going to sing uh, Mighty Fortress is Our God, which is a great song, by the way, uh, but um, I don't know if it's for selfish reasons or the Holy Spirit, we'll blame it on the Holy Spirit, uh, we're going to do something a little different because there's just so many people here. And it was so cool to hear everybody singing together earlier. Uh, I thought we'd just close uh, with the doxology and uh, just kind of take it in. So let's sing together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow.
now receive this blessing, this benediction from the word of God. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.